our lecture today is given by Travis Toon, who is a master's uh, student in global and international students, or <laughs> global, global and international <laughs> studies, excuse me. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree uh, in history uh, from Ottawa University, and for his graduate program, he's researching American uh, foreign policy and strategy in the former Yugoslavia, tied in directly to his, his uh, master's thesis. And I should point out that he won uh, last year's Laird Essay Contest at the graduate level with his um, essay uh, focusing on Kosovo and crisis. Thank you, Bart. Well, that was a great introduction. Uh, and I must make one disclaimer ahead of time. I'm not Serbian. I always do this just so everyone is aware that I find this interesting from an intellectual point of view. I have no Serbian blood or history. So this is uh, the Nedavimo Belgrad uh, protest. There's a, a, a waterfront redevelopment uh, project in Belgrade that's quite controversial. It's uh, backed by half uh, Gulf money and half the Serbian public is supposed to put up, and it's supposed to cost around $5 billion, and the Serbian public thinks that they don't have $5 billion to spend on this, so this is one of the many uh, street protests that have taken place recently. Oh, oh, let's back up. So this is just a picture of Belgrade, in case you guys have never been there or seen it. This is one of my favorite quotes. This is from Ivan Cholovic, a Serbian uh, sociologist and political scientist. He wrote a book about political symbolism in Serbia. And he's got a few of the best meditations on what it actually means to be Serbian and what Serbian nationality and identity is. And I, I think that's probably one of the best ways to put it, given that where Serbia is located, they've always had external pressures placed on them. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the EU now, the United States, NATO. So they are kind of sensitive to outsiders dictating what Serbia is or should be. Sources of frustration in contemporary Serbia, a lot of these uh, mirror other uh, Eastern European countries as well as just other developing nations across the globe. Uh, this international, whoa, international community in stigma is big because they felt like they were wrongfully blamed for what happened in the war. So they're still a little sensitive to that and this is they're just not working. Few statistics just to kind of get you up to date on what's going on in Serbia. Uh, I would think the unemployment rate is much higher. This is the official Serbian government statistics, and we know how Eastern European governments are with their employment statistics. Population ages, you can see that 46% are not of working age. So there's a big issue going on in Serbia, as well as brain drain. You can see the median age is 42. They're bleeding uh, young people. That's the American ambassador to Serbia made kind of a crude joke a few weeks ago, and he said that Serbia's number one export is young people. And they didn't find that too funny there. This is kind of a quick, brief overview of the attitudes that Serbs have towards joining Europe or the West. And as you can see, 61% say Serbia isn't East or West. They've always kind of set themselves up as, you know, in between the third, uh, the third world, the third way, the non-aligned movement. And they still believe in that. They don't want to join NATO and they don't feel the need to be very close to Russia. They want to kind of get the best of both worlds because Serbia needs help from both sides. Joining the European Union. You can see there was no change really in 2015 in how people felt about it. So no, not at all is the answer for joining the European Union. And when I was there, I heard a lot of complaints about taxes and regulations that will come with joining the European Union that already they think you think we work off the books now. Imagine when we have to report to Brussels who's working at the kiosk. So it's a very difficult moment for Serbs to navigate, especially young Serbs. It's either you leave your country or you stay in your country and you have no social mobility. And it's, uh, they're, they're in a place that a lot of other East European countries are right now. And now on to everyday nationalism. Rogers Brubaker is one of my favorite theorists in this area. And I found this to be a useful quote in that Serbian nationalism is usually discussed in a way that is completely different from other forms of nationalism. It's almost a mutant kind of form of nationalism based on you know, these ancient hatreds that all of a sudden lie dormant for 50, 60 years, but then all of a sudden pop up out of nowhere. And, it's, and additionally, it's always kind of a trickle down nationalism. The nationalism was always studied from above. It's always elite driven discourse and elite centered discourse in the study of Serbia and basically how Slobodan Milosevic used history, religion, myth to kind of I guess, trick the Serbian people into war and various, and that's not exactly a, a fair way of putting it because I've been to Serbia twice and talking with everyday Serbs, there's a lot of gray area when it comes to Milosevic because early on they felt Milosevic was representing their interest and later on they found out that he had robbed the country blind. 
So they ha are kind of torn on how to deal with him. And so I've noticed most studies of Serbia are all about elite driven discourse and as well as what elites can do to further European integration. And my concern is that the elites in Serbia have absolutely no credibility. They lost it when Milosevic and his government took over the country and ruined everything. They ruined the economy, they ruined the infrastructure, they got bombed. And so if you think about it, the elites have no, I guess, political capital left with ordinary citizens throughout Serbia. Additionally, oh, I'll go back one more. Additionally, Brubaker, one of his major theories was kind of making a distinction between civic and ethnic nationalism in that there's a large gray area in between. Not every nationalist movement fits firmly into civic or into ethnic. And so he felt that it was better to phrase it as state formed and counter state forms of nationalism. And I would submit to you that everyday nationalism in Serbia now is a counter state nationalism because the state formed nationalism failed them, failed them miserably. So this is Beogradsky Syndicate. This is one of the major rap groups within Serbia. They've been around since 2000. And their latest hit came out last spring. So they're still going. And if you look at them, they're just average kind of everyday Serbs standing there, nothing crazy. And I'm going to show you a clip of their most recent uh, YouTube, oh not YouTube, music video that came out before the Serbian elections last year. And then I will show you the lyrics to this. So just uh, enjoy. It's, it's fairly interesting here. So there's a little bit of that. I'm just going to move it to the end here and show you the conclusion. All right. Fairly interesting, no? All right. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. As you saw, it's a basically a street confrontation. And in Serbia, street protests are what brought down Milosevic. Street protests are a, a very proud part of Serbian culture and especially youth culture. And as you saw there, the police were turned into average citizens. And that, that's a, a departure from former Serbian nationalist movements where the police were a representation of the government. And you'd want to beat the police. Football hooligans, everyone would want to fight the police because you're fighting, not only were you fighting at one point the Yugoslav authorities when you were Serbian, then you were fighting against Milosevic, then you're fighting against what they see as now Western puppets. So uh, we'll go through here briefly. Uh, remember when there were only two channels? These are obviously references to old Yugoslavia. System to lie to you. It means the system is lying to you. And so they're critiquing basically global politics in a way. Politika and Denevnik are, uh, Politika was a Serbian daily within Yugoslavia and Denevnik was a news program. Always the same gang. References to organized crime or just government officials stealing from the people. It was easy to spread propaganda. Milosevic is Serbia was a big time propaganda state. Most people had no idea what was actually going on in Yugoslavia during the wars. They would just hear what Milosevic wanted them to hear. People believe in the words coming from the screen. No room to hear the other side until somewhere over there, directional implying the West. They changed what was going on, not within Serbia, is the implication from this group. 
Today after wars, protests, reforms, democracy, internet, new technology, struggle for the rights and freedom, after they all is still the same is big because they feel like they were promised all of these things would improve their quality of life and they see no improvement whatsoever. Especially demo uh, democracy, they don't have really a, you know, democratic, they do, they vote, but none of them really think it's, it has any sort of integrity. And then additionally, their capitalism is a form of crony capitalism. They had their large companies were protected by the state, the telecom, the major gas kind of companies were protected by the state when privatization came. But international companies pillaged the middle and the low bottom production sectors. So there's no real production chain. There's only a top and a bottom. The middle was basically bought out and I guess cannibalized by competitors within the region who bought on the first privatization. Uh, and still in power, we have lying puppets. And I don't know if you noticed some of the masks that were on them. They were all international politicians. Merkel, Bush, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. What? I couldn't tell who oh, yeah, that. sorry. I could have paused it there. Uh, for nothing, we have a thousand channels and all the social networks and kind of bury our heads in our screens, all fleeing conflict. So essentially, that was a cry to people come out to the streets. And that, was, that video was released two weeks before the Serbian elections last, uh, was it? April, not October, April. And what was interesting is my friends in Serbia were asking me, what ads are you seeing on that video? And I was like, yeah, pff, I don't know, Glade or you know, whatever's gonna cook, you know, clean your house. They go, yeah, we're seeing Vucic campaign ads. And I was like, that's yeah, interesting because the video is, is against Vucic. And Vucic within Serbia, within the Serbian internet companies, had made it so that only his election commercial showed on YouTube. So depending on your internet provider. So we'll move from rap to what I really get passionate about, and that's Red Star Belgrade. And this is, uh, I was at this game actually, this was two years ago, against Ofka Belgrade. And uh, as you can see in the top there is a quote from Dragan Jajic, one of the best players of Red Star, and he's referring to after the breakup of Yugoslavia. Because in 1991, Red Star was the European and world champions. The best team, one of the best, they were called the Brazil of Europe. Their stadium is nicknamed the Maracana, as like the Maracana in Rio de Janeiro because of their style of play. And what's interesting is this is a multi-ethnic group that represented not only Serbia, but then Yugoslavia. Down here in the bottom is Sinisha Mihailovic. His nickname was Barbica, like Barbie doll, because of his long hair. And he, uh, he's a Serb, and he's the captain of the team. Proshinecki, Robert Proshinecki, a period of blonde, was the Croatian captain, or the main representative of Croatia. The goalie was a Kosovo Serb. Uh, two of these gentlemen were from Macedonia. One is from Bosnia, so it was a pretty multi-ethnic group that had taken Europe and the world by storm, especially a small country, Yugoslavia and, and Serbia within that. This is from the 1970s, so you can see this was when they played Tottenham Hotspur in a major European game, and this was uh, last year at a basketball match. So Red Star is still a huge draw, very influential within Serbia. Red Star understands the situation within the country, so they offer free admission to many games whether it be basketball or soccer. And this one says, all to the Maracana, where their stadium is, free admission, Besplaton Ulas, and Aimo Sigani, let's go gypsies. And gypsies is the nickname that Red Star has been given from their rivals Partizan. Partizan thinks that they allow just anybody to join their ranks, and so they're really a representative of everyday citizens within Serbia, but they get the pejorative nickname Sigani since because of that and as such Red Star has taken that as a badge of honor and now calls themselves the Sigani in reference towards Partizan. They also like to be involved in regional politics, the Delie. Here is the major supporters group for Red Star Belgrade and this was, what was the data? So this was a couple months ago. They were discussing getting a regional league back together. The Yugoslav League used to encompass obviously the teams from all over Yugoslavia and now they're all split up into their own tiny little leagues which all are all of poor quality. And the idea is that if we put all the teams back together, we can have a competitive and good league. The Delier do not want that. And so this was a tweet, Zvezda, Serbia, never Yugoslavia. And what I find interesting is that all of these pictures are not from Serbia. These are from other parts of the Balkans. Trebinje in Bosnia, Budva in Montenegro. This one, uh, Lazarevac, is actually in Belgrade. And this one is in... I want to say Kosovo. I don't remember exactly where it was. But so regionally, Red Star is the largest team in the Balkans, the entire Balkans, because there are Serbs spread out throughout the Balkans. The most popular team in Bosnia is Red Star. The Republic of Srpska is almost half of Bosnia, and their main team is Red Star. And I can, so this was another sign at the actual game. Football ski club Serbina Zvezda will never play in the regional league. 
just letting everyone know it's not going to happen. And this one, it, it's, it gets super political, but it's like we can never play soccer with people that killed our children or something like that. It's, it's, it's war rhetoric. This is in Bosnia. Some Red Star fans in Bosnia got together and made a, uh, it says it says here, Delia show their love towards the club in Bosnia. So it's a regional movement that allows Serbs to kind of have a grounding in their history and their culture through Red Star. This happened last week, and this one had me really fired up. This happened on Friday. So Novi Pazar is a team from southern Serbia in the Sanjak region, and they're Bosnian Muslims. So it's kind of a pocket of people that are living on the other side of the border from Bosnia. And their team, Novi Pazar, has always played in the Serbian League, and there are always conflicts when they go there. Whenever Red Star goes down, there's large Turkish flags, kind of very Islamic-centered uh, showing from the fans. And ironically, the owner of this club is a Serbian government minister, Rasim Jajic. And they were punished because they had broken transfer rules. They were buying players illegally when they couldn't. And so the league sent them a written notice saying, you are punished. Those players are suspended. And they said, we can't understand this decision. We need you to translate it into Bosnian. They live in Serbia. They play in the Serbian league. And now they're claiming that they can't understand the language because they're being punished in that language. And so at the game, the Delia, who you've just seen are not exactly the most politically correct group around, uh, told them, they said, do you hear us, people from Pazar? You have Serbian blood. And so they took that as a major provocation. You're saying, you live in Serbia, you've played in the Serbian league, but you don't speak Serbian all of a sudden? It's, it, they've never had this discussion before. So this actually happened last week, and there's been no decision yet on what they're going to do to Novi Pazar, whether they're going to be punished or not. This is another one f right here, Slobodna za Olivera Ivanovic, uh, Freedom for Oliver Ivanovic. He's the leader of the Kosovo Serbs, and he was jailed for war crimes. And he, he wasn't accused of committing war crimes. He was accused of knowing people who had intended to commit war crimes. So they saw it as a political arrest, and as such, they made a display. This is at a EuroLeague basketball game, and what's interesting is they're playing a Turkish team, Anadolu Efes. So this is a broadcast, broadcast across Europe, and the Red Star are signaling to people political messages from Kosovo. So they use these venues as an outlet for Serbian politics, history, and culture. This is uh, also at the stadium. UEFA made the decision to admit Kosovo as a member. And obviously Serbia doesn't recognize Kosovo. And, they, and the Kosovo Liberation Army was labeled as a terrorist organization what, during the conflict. So the UEFA supports terrorism. And of course, in the red and black of the Albanian flag is why they have this. And then they spelled out the actual rules in the UEFA bylines that say Kosovo cannot join because they aren't recognized by the United Nations. So in a way, they're like amateur political commentators and historians all, all wrapped into one. It's very fascinating. And they're all, and to be honest, they're not wrong. That is the rule. They took that off of there. So they're, they're, their main point towards the international community about Kosovo is that you guys are hypocrites. You keep changing the rules for these guys. You punish us with these same European rules and then change the rules to let this group in. So there are, there are some legitimate frustrations there. Of course, Red Star also travels around. This is when they went to Gracenica, Kosovo, to one of the monasteries. And it's kind of a surreal picture. These guys in Gazprom, you know, sweatsuits in this old, you know, 15th, 16th century Serbian Orthodox church. But this is a major symbol to them. They're going to Kosovo to show them we haven't forgotten you. This is a symbol. And they played a game there. So this was it for all the Serbs in Kosovo. They all showed up and were able to pretend like they were the Serbs in Belgrade, ha having a normal life, just going out to re represent Zvezda when, in fact, they don't live a normal life in Kosovo. Vlad and the Night Wolves came to Belgrade a few, uh, two years ago, and they got to see a Red Star match. They came for the uh, celebrations of World War II liberation of Belgrade, is why they were there. And Vlad, and of course, this is the Serbian president, Toma Grobar, over here. Uh, this is uh, fascinating. I got this off of a Red Star fan page. A Serb in Germany was watching the news on the Bosnian Serb referendum a few months ago about a new holiday. And he noticed that they included the Red Star flag in this 
imagery of uber nationalist kind of referendum and what is Red Star doing there? This is the flag of the Republic of Srpska. This is the flag of Serbia. And this doesn't seem to make any sense. And so the joke was that even Germany knows that all of Bosnia is the red and white of Red Star. It was kind of the joke that the Serbian fans told about this. They, and of course it also points, they get to point out that look, these guys don't know what they're talking about. What does Red Star have to do with this referendum? Why are they included in this? And it shows that kind of they think that the West just throws everything at Red Star and at Serbia whenever possible. Not always negative, though, with Red Star. They've been very important throughout Yugoslavia. This is the day Tito, well, we don't know if Tito died on that. This is the day they told everyone Tito had died within Yugoslavia. And Serb, I mean, serving as Vezda, Red Star was about to play Hajduk Split of Croatia. This was the major Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. soccer match for everyone to watch. And they announced that Tito had died. And you could see these Serbian players who were supposed to, you know, crying. So it wasn't exactly uh, Serbia versus Croatia always. There was some nuance within that in everyday citizens. And Red Star has been an important part of many events within Yugoslavia. Additionally, Red Star doesn't just belong to those hooligans. This is Novak Djokovic, the number one tennis player in the world. Grew up in Belgrade and is a major Red Star fan. And I, I usually focus on the kids, so the guy behind him. Look how fired up this little guy is. And I'm happy about that because Honestly, he doesn't have that much to look forward to. It's very tough in Serbia right now, and him growing up in that environment has to be very difficult. So when you can find something to hang on to, that's partially why Red Star is they're so passionate is because they get to let out a lot of frustrations within society at these games, with these victories. And so this was a major international victory. Djokovic was there. And this is uh, Ivo Andrić. I don't know if people are familiar with Ivo Andrić, the famous Yugoslav writer. He was a Red Star fan. He was a Red Star basketball fan. You can see this KK, Košarki club. And uh, he's, so this was in the stands. Uh, I think it was one of his birthdays. And this says down here, celebrating our glorious past. But uh, so th they're historians, and they're also important kind of cultural pieces that go along with being a, a member of Red Star. Of course, I show these pictures because this is kind of the everyday citizens, because I, I, I'm a Red Star fan, but I'm not a Serbian nationalist. So I don't exactly fit with the first kind of examples I showed you, but with these other gentlemen who are just kind of living their lives it's like it's it's a good time again this is that same group this is in that section with that kind of intimidating he brings this little little boy and it's not so they're not a bunch of crazy violent hooligans they may appear that way but they're average people and what are football hooligans after all disaffected youth in every country and people want to call them right wing left they're people without many options in society and so they use these outlets to express that this is the final and I'll wrap it up here does anybody know who that is I know Alex, this is Alexander Vucic, the Prime Minister of Serbia. This is when he was a hooligan for Red Star in the 80s. And then there's him in the stands, and then there's him now. And now, because he's the Prime Minister and he's seen as being involved in kind of corrupt government, he's no longer welcome among the Red Star fans. But at one point, he was leading them to fight against the Croatians in the stadium, and now he's kind of disowned by the Red Star fans for that. And so I kind of went quick. I, I talk very fast. So there's the end. Uh, briefly, I'll show you on here. I had written this down. Uh, this is the Serbian national uh, crest. It's f uh, four Cyrillic S's. Samo Sloga Serbina Sposova. And it stands for un only unity will save the Serbs. And this is, of course, Serbina Zvezda Belgrade. And so you'll walk around Serbia and you'll see graffiti like this and graffiti like this. And this is them taking in Serbian identity with with Red Star. And given that Red Star represented Serbian identity within Yugoslavia, these are very meaningful symbols to Serbs and other people, uh, Red Star fans in general. So, I guess, any questions? I guess, kind of flew through that.